I do that so that people at home think they're missing something as they watch it on our stream. It's good to have you here this morning. I'm Pastor Bob. Uh, a couple of announcements just before I, we get into our third week in Jonah. Who's excited? Oh my goodness, what am I going to do with you, It's not even cold out there today. Uh, you know from our announcement last week uh, that our partners in Cambodia, Darren and Monaco, who are doing such an amazing work, had come to visit us and said, we need some help. And that God put his hand on Ben in our congregation and said, well, those are the gifts you have, Ben, so you're the one to go help them. And we asked you to pray as Ben tries to figure out flights. We have some flights, but you need to pray against what restrictions will change. And so Ben's planning to take some of his time and to go in to help Darren and Monaco get set up. Uh, you can catch up on that or just ask Ben about it. He'd love to tell you about God asking and him saying yes. Uh, and then he said, hey, I, I've got extra space. What can we bring? And Darren said, hey, there's some things that we need. And so there's a whole list on our website. Uh, if you want to participate, you can. If you're like, hey, I'd, help, I'd love to help defray some of the costs of doing that, you can do it through our missions partnership. But one of the asks was for unlocked, okay, here the unlocked, older tablets or phones because these people live in a dump <laughs> and they scavenge for a living and uh, some of them don't have that form of communication and there's plans that they can get that are min anyways they can refurbish them and use them so then people were saying well how old is too old what's if it's got a good screen and it works uh that was and it's unlocked those were the three things right ben did I miss anything? And a good battery. So uh, if you have that and you want to donate it, drop it off here. We'd be happy to pack it up and send it along with Ben. All right, it's all time we're taking for that. Uh, let's pray and get to work. Father, thank you for your word, and I thank you for how much we're learning. I thank you that this morning we can just set aside time to be with you. Uh, Lord, I'm already so encouraged by seeing people respond to you in baptism, by uh, just hearing about what you're doing in other places, and we just anticipate this time. So open our ears and our eyes, speak to us through your word, Lord, and then free us to respond to you with praise and worship. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, you may be visiting, joining us online for the first time. It's probable that you know the story of Jonah, but let me just give you a very, very quick so far. God shows up where his prophet, and he says, Jonah... Get up and go to Nineveh. I want their, their evil deeds has risen to the point where I have a message I want you to send. Nineveh, capital of Assyria, would be in modern-day Iraq, was one of the biggest, most modern cities. But it was a place of his enemies. And Jonah takes off the other way. So if Nineveh's that way, he goes that way. Heads for a ship, finds passage, gets on the ship, and off he goes. He's going to get away from the presence of the Lord. He just doesn't want to do what God's asking him to do. Well, God sends a storm, freaks out seasoned sailors. They're pitching the cargo off. They're trying to figure out what's going on. They're asking this question, why has this befallen us? Like, and they awaken Jonah and say, pray to whatever God you have because we're going to die. And they say, by the way, who are you and what are you doing here? And he says, I, I am actually a Hebrew, and I follow the God in charge of all of this, and I'm on the run from him. And they said, well, what could we do about this? And he said, well, they, the only thing really to do is to throw me overboard. And while they struggle with that for a minute or two, that becomes the choice that they make. And as they cry out to God, they pitch Jonah overboard. We hit chapter, the end of chapter 1 into chapter 2. God sends a great fish. And it swallows Jonah. And then all of chapter 2 is this discourse with Jonah. What's going on in the three days in the belly of the fish? As he realizes some things and he cries out in desperation. And he says, God, you are doing this. I, I surrender to who you are. I know you're the only hope for salvation. But no matter what you do, I, I'm going to be obedient. And I promise you this is how it's going to change and God hears Jonah, and God responds to Jonah. 
and then Jonah's puked up on the beach. Now, um, we don't know how far from Nineveh, where, how. Uh, there's some things that they just don't give us details on, but it had to be stinky and it had to be spectacular. Yes? All right. So here we are, chapter 3. Let's read it together, and then we'll see what God's got for us today. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, they put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw that they did what they did and how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster he had said he would do to them and did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. Isn't this a great story? Um... We're going to move quickly, so uh, hang on, and uh, here we go. So the first thing I notice is this idea that Jonah's called back on mission. How many of you, when you face an interruption or a crisis, you've got a rhythm to life going, you've got a mission, you're doing this, and then everything kind of falls apart? Maybe somebody ends up in the hospital, maybe a pandemic comes, maybe, like, who knows what could go on. How hard is it after a crisis or after an intervention to get back into rhythm and back on mission? I mean, I find that, right? You put a project down and and you get distracted by something else or something's an emergency and you come back to it. I'd say a fish in a storm and running from God's a bit of a disruption emergency. But it starts out by saying God comes to him and says, a second time, arise and go. And Jonah has now said, I pledge, whatever it is I'm supposed to do, I vow I'm going to do it. And God says, the mission, Jonah, is unchanged. And I love that he's the God of second chances. That just because you missed out on the first opportunity or you decided to run, he pursues and he comes along and he says, hey, you have a role, you have a mission, you have something I've asked you to do. And it's unchanged. I really like that God says, you're going to call out what I tell you to. In Bob words, I put no editing, please. (laughs) Now, I think Jonah would have been okay, okay with the fact that the message might not be kind or friendly. But God was very specific. What I tell you, I want you to do. And it leads me to this question that's been bugging me for weeks. We know from the story that Jonah doesn't like these people even get a chance to meet a merciful God. And we know he's not really cool with God's plan for him to go and offer that to him. He thinks they should suffer the punishment coming to them. But what mattered was obedience. And even though his heart wasn't in the right place, he went reluctantly. And I had to ask the question, like, throughout the New Testament... We have all of these conversations with Jesus where he looks at the heart, right? And the Pharisees had all the obedience stuff down. And this is something you can take home and wrestle with because it's a both and. 
Because I know people who know what God's asked them to do, but because in their heart they feel differently or they don't like that plan for them or, or they want to just grab that, I, I can solve loneliness my way, I can solve this my way. Everything to satisfy that is at my fingertips. They say, until you change my heart, obedience is impossible. And Jonah would say differently. Now, we know from the story that God doesn't give up on his heart. We know in chapter 4, he starts to deal with his heart, but obedience came first. And even if he didn't like it, he went reluctantly. He doesn't wait till he's okay with God's plan to go. But he's back on mission. And then he goes and gives what I like to title the worst message on record. 40 days and you're done, right? Now, there's three options here from the commentators and from my study, and and we need to take this into account. It could be that this is a summary of a longer discourse, that the discourse was quite a bit longer and they just boiled it down to the point for the point of the story and said, this is what he said. It could be that God was very specific with him and said, all you're going to say is this, because I'm going to get the glory, and you're going to see what's going to happen. Or it could be, it could be, that Jonah just did the minimum. (laughs) Thinking, I really don't want these people to get it. And God just used simple obedience. Whatever happened, it was not a fancy message. Not well-received in, in the sense that it would have been a welcome message. But it was the message all the same. And I want to make a point here. Have you ever noticed, and I think Jonah knew this, and I'm sitting on the stool so I don't get too many. Jonah knew that when God pronounced judgment through his prophets, it was coming as sort of a last resort. The very last thing he wanted to do was bring punishment. What he wanted to do was bring salvation. What he wanted to do was bring redemption. What he wanted was repentance and return. And the announcement of it was simply that proclamation that said, um, if if something doesn't happen, judgment's on its way. I mean, when you really think about it, there are times in Scripture where God just, people broke the rules and boom, reach out to touch the ark, drop dead. There are times when there's no warning, right? But it's interesting that when God announces judgment, he's giving people a chance to repent and respond and be redeemed. We go on to see this amazing picture of repentance. So if you haven't been paying attention, I'll tell you a little bit about Nineveh just real quick. Their identity, their culture, was around their violence and their brutality. They were a people renowned, renowned for how incredibly evil they were. The abuse of people, the use of people, slavery, sexual slavery. Uh, If you do some reading into that time and place, that was their identity. They took amazing pride in it. And they wanted everyone else to fear them. A place renowned for its violence, arrogance, and evil. If you wanted to go to uh, one of the other prophets that talks about Nineveh, you could go to Nahum 3. And there's a bunch of other literature from those days where kings would brag about how arrogant they were, like just how important they were and that their society was the top of the heap and that they conquered everything and the whole world feared them or feared them. And there's one text that I won't take time to get into from somebody, from a historian, that talked about bodies piling up in the street. Like, just get a sense for who these people were. Why is that important? They were the least likely to have soft hearts or be ready for a message. I mean, think about it. Picture who you would think is the least likely to be interested remotely in your God or what you have to say. Now multiply it. 
give them pride and arrogance, have their identity all be set around how violent they were and how much the world, world feared them. That's who we've got. And the Bible doesn't say they loved Jonah's message. It said they believed God. Three things that I ran across that I think are at play here. Um, in some of the study, or they, they recognized that there was an authority that they needed to respect and a power in the message. In some of the historical work I did, there's two plagues that come through this area of Nineveh a couple of years before this. And they were devastating. And I mean, for a country wrestling with, or a world wrestling with what's going on, you see that God was preparing something. Then we know that just before this, there was a total eclipse of the sun that they would have seen as divine anger somehow. There's a God that needs to be appeased. So a series of calamities, a series of life-interrupting events seem to be preparing them for this message that comes. But we can't get away from this truth that God has a way of just revealing to people who he is and what he does. And that that message absolutely empowered drove those people to repentance. It's the power of the word of God. This is what I want you to say. And so they believed God. And then we have this public and visible action. Now know that they, the world knew them as Ninevites. The world knew what they did. And so their evil was renowned. And God says in chapter 1, their evils become like untenable. I'm going to deal with this. But the public action they took shows the fear and the response. First, sackcloth, a covering of a material that just indicated mourning, grieving. It was a sign of something, a surrender. Fasting, the denial of something for self, looking to the divine for answers. Now, this image of the king getting off his throne, and, you know, think about this, you guys. Who has a lazy boy at home that they like to sit in? And when you're in your lazy boy and you have your remote, don't you look for anyone to bring you what you need? I would. Okay, so this king is on the throne, and, and he thinks he's a deity even. And he's conquered the known world. For him to leave his throne, take off his robe, put on sackcloth and sit in ashes. Speaks of the conviction, the belief, the terror. Like, see what's happening. This action is public and visible. And then there's this proclamation. Everything stops. Anybody, anybody been around animals when it's feeding time? What are they? Noisy, right? It says nobody's feeding the herds. Nobody's doing anything. Everything stops so that we might seek salvation. Doom is imminent. I pondered this inclusion of the animals. I, I, I kind of thought, well, maybe it means wealth and security. But then in chapter 4, Jesus, when, er, when God's talking to Jonah, he says to him, uh, you know, the animals matter to me. And if somebody figures that out before I do, send me a note. It'd be great. I don't understand it all. But even the animals were covered. He said, don't feed anything. Don't feed. It, it, it had to be, and then call out mighty, mightily to God. It had to be this absolutely deafening, repenting cry for salvation from the hardest, most unlikely people. And then he says, turn from evil ways and from violence. Just a thought. I, I got to hurry here. Do you think he should have spelled out, okay, what's evil, what's not? What's violent, what's not? What, what, how far can we go? What should we do? It, they just knew. And part of this was turning away from that and turning towards what God wanted. They did it all with an unknown outcome. This amazes me. 
I mean, if Jonah would have said, if you do this, then God will relent, or here's a plan of action, or here's what you can do, he didn't. He just said, this is what God's going to do, and that fear fell on them, and they knew publicly, visibly, everything stops. And they just said that God may turn from his fear, fierce anger, that we may not perish. They did it without a guaranteed outcome. And then we see two very distinct responses. Uh, we see God relenting and accepting and being merciful and being true to his character and showing that he delights in the redemption of his creation. And we see Jonah angry and bitter. Because while Jonah had just experienced the mercy of God, they didn't deserve it. And they didn't have to pay. So that's the big question. So what? I've got to flip my page here. So if you are a Christian and you're here this morning, you're listening, uh, the Bible has been incredibly clear that God calls us to be on mission. We're given a place in his family. We're given gifts. He's prepared works for us to participate in. He's said, you're going to be my ambassadors. You're going to be my light. The world's going to know the gospel through you. They're going to meet Jesus through you. And he sends us on a mission. There's this clear expectation for his children that they will be on mission with him. And just like Jonah, many of us experience seasons of failure and disobedience. Where the world became more important, where we went our way. And when we start to get that figured out, and we realize that this storm is pushing us back to God, that something has become more important than Jesus, um, we need to get back on mission. The luxury of not being a witness or of fill in the blank. I want you to know that seasons of failure and disobedience don't negate the mission God has for you. He's the God of second chances. And that call hasn't gone off of your life. That expectation is still there. And then it becomes a matter of obedience. Am I going to respond? Is God going to be the authority? Does he have the right to ask me to do what I don't really want to? Does his way really matter? And do I realize that obedience often precedes my heart change? Our third D here is duplication, right? God's heart duplicated in you. And, and he does want to get a hold of your heart. And it's not just all about your obedience, but it is involving your obedience. And often when you're obedient, your heart begins to change. Secondly, do not leave here today. Do not turn your TV off without knowing this. No one is outside of God's reach. Okay? You have no idea what God's doing in your coworker, in that person that comes to your mind that's the hardest, in that person that, that just... God's all about the unlikely, the unworthy, messed up people matter to him. And you don't know how God's preparing things in somebody's life for that moment when he says, hey, hey, Lyndon, today's the day. You put your name in there. Today is the day. And there may be people you're giving up on and stopping praying for. Quit it. Keep praying God's at work. Don't give up. But there may be people you've written off And I want you to know we serve a God that desires that none perish. He delights in the salvation of his creation, in the redemption. He cares so much he sent his son. And so as you think about this, there'll be people God brings to mind that you've given up on or that you've said are just too hard or, or they're just too set. And there'll be others 
that if we're honest in our heart, we're just reluctant to bring that to you because we know we serve a merciful God and they won't have to pay for what they've done. We're going to talk some more about that next week. Jonah's struggle with the mercy of God, the undeserved favor that he gives the repentant. Man, know this was you're here that the word of God is powerful. Hebrews talks about it, living, acting, dividing. We believe that the Holy Spirit works in that and that it's the work of God to open eyes and ears. And so for all of you that said, man, I'm afraid to talk about it or to share or to... That was the worst sermon ever and look what happened. So if God tells you to tell your story to somebody, tell it. And point them to Jesus, not to you. And finally, I think we can learn from this story a little bit about repentance. Psalm 51.17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Don't miss that picture. Those people were broken and contrite. What does it look like in your life? To be broken when God shows you your sin. To be contrite for how it's affected everyone around you what that looks like. Don't miss the turning from and turning to. If there's things in your life that you need to put at the foot of the cross, you need to give to Jesus, and you need to say, this has become an idol in my life. This has become more important. I've elevated this above this. I'm sorry, Lord. Repentance is setting it down, turning away from and turning to, putting it right. And then if you want to discuss something around the table today and talk with some friends, talk about the power of corporate repentance. What does it look like if the people of God together say, we have gotten off mission. We got embroiled in internal stuff or in this or in that. We ask God for forgiveness and we walk into the second chance. So, as you think about next week and you read chapter 4, here's what I'd like you to ask yourself. When you encounter God's mercy for others, what's really going on in the heart? How are you really responding? Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. I'm so privileged to be uh, just a part of bringing it. I know that it's the work of the Holy Spirit, and I know this, the worst messages empowered by the power of your word have the best results. And so, Father, I just commend my friends to you. Now as we stand and we give you our worship, would you be glorified in it? Would you be honored by it? And would you free us to express ourselves? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.